Welcome, Welcome to, to the Father Focus Podcast. Father Focus. Check, check. And why are we talking about this? Why does it matter? Why does it matter? So shaping your kids into powerful people. Bro, let that brother yeah. fly. Yeah, check, check. All right, let's ready, go. Ready? All right, let's go. Let's go. I'm going to pass it. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Father Focus Podcast, Season 3. Here with my boys and return guest coming back for his round two debut, ding, ding. our friend Corey Russell. What let's up, Corey? Go. How are you, bro? What's going on, guys? Let's, let's go. Let's go. All right. So we were just talking about the Denver Nuggets and the LA Lakers, and you were telling us some How debauchery thoughts LeBron about James LeBron. Is. Would you like to share your opinions yes. with the audience again? <laughs> well, I, I made it very clear last year when i was with you guys that it's very that it's no no competition michael jordan's the goat it is a competition but, let's go but <laughs> own it we can still Except celebrate it. what is happening with lebron james here we are year 21 i mean my goodness almost 40 years old averaging what he's done yep. i just you've got to be able to enjoy it because guys these times go by so fast and i just want to suck all the all the goodness in from this season. Yes. <laughs> so, do you think the Lakers are going to come back and win, or you think it's over? Uh, there's no answer for Nicholas <laughs> Jokic. Mm-hmm. There's just no answer. So yeah. basically, LeBron exit round one of the playoffs. Yeah, it's sad. Yeah. They should have lost in the play-in. Yeah, is what they should have done. <laughs> they would be playing. I think they could take Oklahoma City. Right. But they mm. can't take Denver. Yeah. They no can't. way. Yeah. That's no right. way. Well, it'll just further solidify LeBron's legacy as not the GOAT, basically, is what we're seeing. But, all right, enough about that. I was about to say, because he's already the GOAT. Oh, here we go. It's already solidified. All right, anyways, nonsense, moving on. So, Corey, obviously, you know, we're really passionate about two things, fatherhood and manhood. And so, last time we talked, we talked a lot about fatherhood. Thought it was an awesome interview, but we kind of want to talk about something a little bit different today. Maybe we'll get into that down the road. But we kind of wanted to start with something that's a very current issue within the church. And I think we're asking a lot of questions as younger leaders in our 30s and millennial leaders. And, you know, I mean, really what we're seeing right now is uh, a massive falling away of spiritual leaders in the church. And I think a lot of guys our age, and even we're having conversations like, how do we process this? Like, why are we seeing this? What is God doing in the middle of this? Like, what's the answer to this question? What's our response? And I know, obviously, it hit very close to home because you're very connected at IHOP and everything that's come out about Mike Bickle. And so I think, in a sense, like, as a, as a spiritual father that really God's using you as, like, we're looking for answers and direction and clarity to try to understand, one, what the heck is going on, but two— how do we respond and avoid this happening again in our generation? Yeah, I, I would say 2023 and 2024, one of the hardest years in ministry. And I've been in ministry since 2000. So it, it was quite a shaking year. You know, I did spend a long season at IHOP and to see one of the, the most influential, his life, his you know, his teaching, everything else, so yeah. dra- dramatically impacted me, shaped me to walk through to see so many blind spots, fraudulent areas, brokenness, abuse that took place. It was really disillusioning, profoundly disappointing. And 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 I, I'm coming away with it. I feel like I've got my legs back under me, and I feel like coming away from... Uh, you know, just processing a lot of it. I think we're at the end of, I'm praying for this, but I really feel yes, like we're please. at the end of the of an era of the one man show, of the cult of personality mm-hmm. and it being built around one man's gift yeah. or, mm-hmm. or one man's personality and then systems that allow these men to live isolated without any accountability, without any right. sense of team and vulnerability my prayer is is that the recent exposures are judging that old wineskin wow. and are ushering in a new day of team ministry and brothers that are known uh, and that know each other in the in the most difficult and uh, vulnerable areas that allow safety for the for the people for the community and for the leader so that we don't have to get all the way to the top right. you know get into your 60s 
and then right. in a moment, in, in months, it what took 40 down. years is now bang. Yeah, right. yeah. Just so I would say so. In, in, in my context in our church, you know, we have a lot of guys, young guys uh, who are on staff with us and uh, girls as well. And it's like, you know, we see this and it, it is, it's just heartbreaking. And of course, we're not intimately connected in the sense of like, we don't actually know these people, but without a doubt, uh, been connected with a lot of them and, and their ministry has been impacted. And so we look at them, especially as young as like these guys, these are the heroes, right? These are the heroes of the faith of our generation, yeah. uh, have done a lot of great things. And um, I think one of the things that that I sometimes wrestle with, I'm like, dude, I don't want to, I don't want to be that guy. Like nobody want, nobody sets out to be the guy to go yeah, yeah, up yeah. and then and then, you know, uh, you know, Samson. Like we don't want to die in the enemy's camp, right? And so that, I think that's the struggle with a lot of like yeah. the young people that I'm around right now. They're like, man, is is there anything real anymore? Is there anything authentic? Like, is it real? And that's really what but it kind of pulls the rug out from under us. And, you know, they trust the Lord and their hope is in God. And, you know, that's the thing I think that to mostly be validated. Yeah. But could you speak a little bit to, you know, younger people who admire all these guys? And it's not just one, it's multiple people, like you said, last couple of years Jeez, uh, and man. even beyond that. I mean, it's just been, you know, all the way from the 80s, right? There's been men who have fallen. You've idolized these people. Uh, and in and, and, and a certain, I'll just have this little caveat here that, even in a respectful way, like we can honor people, not worshiping them or deifying wow. them, but we respect them and we want examples of who's doing it well. And it's so long and then they do it wrong. Like how can you speak to like maybe a younger, uh, younger fathers, younger men who are wanting to be in the ministry, is going after God uh, and, and um, to where there's hope? Like, man, what, what, how can we preserve ourselves? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think. This is something that, I mean, on just a personal level, I'm 47 now, and I, I've i just said, God, I never want to graduate from being the 21, 22-year-old kid who didn't know much, but had this hunger and this passion for Jesus. Yeah. And I've said, God, I want to keep first love first place in my life, no matter how bad the storms are, the disappointments, mm -hmm. the all the different uh, experiences you have over the years. God, don't let that flame die. And so on a personal level, I've always wanted to keep it simple about a fresh fire for Jesus. Um, so, so that's one thing. The, the other thing is brothers. And, and I think, you know, we talk a lot about, which is beautiful, fathers and sons, you know, passing mantles down. But I think we miss the gift in brothers. And, and yet that's some of the greatest battle is, you know, whether it's Cain and Abel, you know, Joseph and the brothers, David and the brothers, Jesus and the brothers. I, I think there's a glory found when you've got that iron sharpening iron and you've got brothers born for adversity. When you can really break through in your early years with one trusted friend, you know, Proverbs 17, a friend loves at all times. Brothers are born for adversity. If you could find that one, and I, I don't go look, I think the Lord's, the calling of the soul and the hunger that you have is going to connect you with someone with a similar passion. Yeah. And I think, I, I think when you find that, get, go, go real with them. No pretension, no hiding, no hallelujah, glory to God, while all these other areas, I'm grateful to God. I wasn't really looking for it because I didn't know it, but God brought me into contact with a brother in my early 20s, early years of marriage, and I, looking back on it, it saved my life. Mm, wow. um, and so I, you really just want to get real. Don't buy into the hype, young leaders. You're not that awesome. <laughs> I, I know that we've got so much around us. You, got, you want to live authentic and real, and I think the call to prayer is, is, is an authentic. You, you want to live authentic, and we're not faking anybody out. I can fake somebody out with a gift. But who you really are alone is who you are. Yeah, that's good. That's good. The adversity piece, having brothers is so good. So you mentioned brothers. So with everything that's happened, everything that's going on, um, Corey, um, what would you say? I mean, a, a lot of I mean, I, it's not just been we heard about Orange here recently and just, you know, almost tired of hearing about it, afraid to turn on the computer, see the headlines. Um, what 
you mentioned accountability, but what other things um, I think, and I, I think prayer and fasting is key. I'm going to, I'm going to answer my own question, but what other things do you think that, that can be preventative measures that be, that could be taken? Like, you know, like for young leaders going into ministry, you know, like, like social media has made it to where you can, you can, you can, I say this way, you can create a following without being a follower. You know, you haven't learned how to follow. You haven't went through the process. You haven't been through the crucible. You haven't been through the fire. And, but yet you got this instant access, instant following. You're, you're, you're famous. What are some things that can be done that you would say, like, what, we can guard against this or what can be preventative things? Like, hey, I learned this when I was younger. What advice would you give the young leaders? I'll tell you this. I think we've made the goal wrong. I think we've made the ministry, the calling, and the destiny, the purpose, and the goal. And I think, you know, if you, you get skewed off on the foundation, it'll skew. The, you really won't know how messed up the building is until you get about 10, 20, 30 years in. And then there's the fault lines because of a faulty foundation. I think we've got to reorient the next generation of leaders to God becoming their reward and them knowing God and not the breakthrough in the ministry platform. Mm -hmm. And I think that feeds a lust. It feeds visions of grandeur. And when God becomes your reward, I like to say it this way, when the greatest pain of your life is how much more of God can I know, the, the, the big breakthroughs aren't that awesome and the big disappointments aren't that devastating. Mm -hmm that you've got this sense, we've got to reorder what is it, like Genesis 15, Abraham, you're going to be awesome, inheritor, father of many nations. I myself am your exceedingly great reward. And I think we've got to reorder what's our reward. God is our reward. Okay, brother, that sounds nice. That sounds nice, brother. No, no, the fact you say it sounds nice means you haven't touched it. It means you haven't truly fallen powerfully in love with the fact that you're known by God and that the kiss of his word mm. touching your heart is the greatest thrill. It's okay. better than a thousand people in your congregation. It's better than a million people on your subscriber list. It's that the kiss of the word of God touching you and the spirit of prayer resting on you. There is nothing that's worth more than a trillion dollars. And so I think reward systems yeah. set us up for long-term success because you're going to find it's going to be an illusion in the sand when you quote unquote, get that open door mm -hmm. and you're going to get there and go, this ain't that awesome. Yeah. It's not really that great. I, it's going to be filled with this. And then, which I think then, then you begin to say, well, what more is there? God right. yeah, yeah. must become our reward. So I, I, I know I'm I, preaching. No, I, I remember, um, uh, I heard Ronald Bunky. I got to work for uh, Christ for All Nations, and I got to rub shoulders with him a little bit. And uh, there was a uh, an interview that he that he did uh, that I heard. And somebody asked him. They said, Pastor Bunky, like, what do you think it's going to be like when 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 you die and you go meet Jesus face to face? And he said, You know what? I don't think I'll be surprised. I already know him. And honestly, from all the, the, the encounters that I had with him, his greatest joy, like I was telling somebody um, in, another, um, in another conversation, uh, you know, I heard four or 500,000 people shouting his name, Bunky, Bunky. And uh, he t he, I asked him, I said, hey, what does that do to your heart when you hear that? A after we were having breakfast, I said, what does that do to your heart? And he said, you know, he said, I don't receive their praise or their criticism. All they're doing, like in the Old Testament, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're just celebrating the God of Bunky. Today they celebrate the God of Bunky. Tomorrow they will know him. Glory to God. You know, and, and I think that's, that's part of the key there. I think that's awesome. So organizationally, so you, that's really good. Thanks for sharing that. But organizationally, so do you think organizations, these ministries are ready for what you're saying? You, you, you made a comment just now. You said... The reward needs to change, but organizations are rewarding the very thing. Yeah, go ahead. Performance and and so is it is it not just an individual problem? Is it an organizational problem that we're looking at? And can they make? Can we make the shift? You mentioned team. Like we're used to the one man. We're used to the one man or woman doing everything. Um, organizationally, we we reward certain things. 
Prayer and fasting isn't one of them. I'm, I'm, you know what I mean? Like, like, like intimacy with Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I don't mean to preach, but I'm, I want to ask you, can you think we, we make that shift that's needed? I'm, I'm praying to God and spending my life believing so. I think we need leaders like David that are going to prioritize the presence and ministry to God before ministry to people. Hmm. And, and so I think there's a restructuring going on. I, I really think part of what's happening, at least in my world, there's a decentralizing of the quote unquote, I'm done with movements, prayer mm -hmm. movement or mm -hmm. worship movement. It's, it's the local church that I think God's moving into. And, and, and I think, I think we're, I think we need leaders. We need praying leaders that beget praying churches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I think, I think that organizationally praying leaders, which means you're only going to survive in this world not based solely on your skill set yeah. and gift mix, but on your intimacy and authority in prayer. Yeah. And I think that's done corporately. I think we build that corporately. I think we build that individually. But that's what we begin to reward. And, and, uh, and I think I, 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 that's what I'm believing. When I'm looking at Isaiah 6 in this season, I think we're in Isaiah 6 season where Uzziahs are dying. <laughs> Messiahs, the ones we put our hopes in are dying. Mm. And in that year, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. And then he said, uh, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. So I think there's a restored vision of the king on the throne mm -hmm. and not little kings on the thrones. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we want to get delivered from orphans on thrones and get the king on the throne. Mm -hmm. That's good. Number That's good. two, he says, uh, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean mm -hmm. lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So I think it's, it's prophetic ministry, leadership and organizations that are in touch with our, with, with our sinfulness and with the need for change. And, and I, think, I think it's coming to an end. I mean, old dogs, some of these dogs will take a second dying, but I feel like we're <laughs> at the end of an era. Yeah. I feel like we're at the end of an era yeah, sure. of what worked because there's a new generation yeah. that's looking for something else. Yeah, mm -hmm. no doubt. I think we are on the precipice of a transition. I know we've talked about that. It, it just feels like it. It feels like a lot of what's happening, even within the global church, is God's judgment um, against a toxic culture of leadership and abuse and manipulation and the elevation of man. You know, I think the, the question me and my friends ask a lot is, we know what everyone else thinks, but is anyone asking what God cares about? Mm -hmm. and, and, there's, and there's a lot of that reality, especially in our generation, where it's like, we've seen the best the church can do without God. You know, we've seen the best performance, the best production, the most giftedness, but yet we look at our generation, and statistically, Christianity is declining rapidly, you know? So it's like, I heard John Tyson say this, I don't know if you listen to this, but he said he felt like what happened at Asbury was God's indictment against the American church and the Western church, because look where revival visited, a place with no famous people, not great worship, not a city that was well known, not a place that people flocked to. Like there was nothing you could point to and say, this is the reason God visited here. There was nothing man could take credit for, it was sovereignly the Lord. And I thought that was so insightful because I think we naturally and instinctively look to a person as the reason God does something. And God doesn't need us, but he wants to use us. And so I, you know, I guess my question is specifically for men is I feel like what we're seeing is not necessarily just the fall of spiritual leaders, but we're seeing the fall of spiritual men. You know, it feels like the either it's a demonic attack or it's just compromise, but it feels like the head's getting cut off, in a sense, the spiritual Both, authority yeah. that's supposed to be in place. So I think the question every man should ask, and I'm going to ask you is, how do we stay pure? Because a lot of the stuff that's happened is sexual in nature, right? Um, how do we stay pure in such a perverse culture? Like it feels like there's so much mixture in the church that the reality is is that a lot where we're finding exposed is that the men that were supposed to live that Psalms 24, 6 life, clean hands and a pure heart, right? They were, they were just as compromised and living in, in sexual perversion just like everyone else. So how do we stay pure? How do we live a life of integrity that we say, like Paul said, I finished my race, I fought the good fight. Like, wh what, what do we do? What do men do? Uh, <laughs> blessed, blessed is the man who fears the Lord. I think we need a restoration of the fear of the Lord. 
you know, I've heard John Bevere share that about Jim Baker. Yeah. I never stopped loving God. Stop. I stopped yeah. fearing yeah. him. And I think we need an awareness that God sees and that God God responds and that, that there's nothing hidden from him. I think reality of real consequences, living before the eyes of God, grieving God, and then there's long-term consequences. But I think it's that. And then I think it's just losing intimacy. It's, it's losing that freshness of working for God instead of intimacy with God. So keeping a constant state, and this is hard because, you know, we are all preachers. We're in the ministry. We're running. There's needs. And when I've, I've always said when I'm preaching more from the Bible than crying when I read it, I know that I'm on a steady decline in my interior life. And so I, I, I think we need to safeguard intimacy and then living in community is, is the best. And at the end of the day, going to battle and, and every, everybody it's about everybody's battles in different areas and levels and what that looks like, but it's going to require us to come off our islands. Yeah. I think that's interesting too. It's, you know, there are safeguards obviously that we should have in place, but without a doubt, um, even if those safeguards are in place, we still can hide in the midst of safeguards. Right. Absolutely. So like you're saying, yes. You know, you know, we need to, in our own hearts, have a kind of confidence in ourselves. I'm not saying, you know, apart from God, but like, look, I am going, the fear of the Lord. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to keep myself from worth, worthless things. I'm going to have those yeah. clean, or, or else, what's the point? Why put the safeguards in place yeah. uh, if I'm just going to be able to hide? Um, it's the appearance of safety. It's not yeah. the actual sure, reality. Sure, which, which goes back to the yeah. heart. Because if, if my heart is crooked, I'll, I can find a way to sin. Right. You know, it's yeah. not going to be very difficult for me to yeah. have to, to figure out uh, with corruption in my heart and the heart is deceitful above all things. It, it, it yeah. can do some some awesome things to figure out how to sin, right? Yeah, because, yeah. The so, safety's in the Lord. The safety's in Him, right? yeah. I think. I mean, And I think it requires, like you were saying, Corey, um, I was reminded of Gideon. He tore down the idol and then built an altar, and uh, to the Lord. And I and I think that like you're and just to amen in agreement with what you're saying. It's 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 to tearing down of the idols in our heart, and then intentionally building rebuilding altars to the Lord. You know, apart from it's hard to. Um, I think we we've lost our first love. Mm -hmm. You know, we we've we've forsaken the place of prayer and intimacy, and we've and we've 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 tried to live like Christ apart from Him. And we've somehow we've been led to believe that things you're saying, prayer, intimacy, fasting, that those things aren't aren't necessary, aren't foundational, aren't pillars, you know, um, in the in the church in the church. Yeah. So, I, I was gonna say, did I'm you? I'm thinking of I'm 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 thinking of James five sixteen, where it, where it says, "Confess your trespasses," and I really feel like this is a verse. For, for this podcast. James 5, 16, confess your trespasses one to another. And he says, for the uh, effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, it does what? It avails much. Okay. So, all right. So he's, he's talking about brothers getting honest with one another and then another brother praying for you. Okay. And then he's going to liken, he's going to liken us in brotherhood to Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, okay? And he prayed. When we know Elijah was prone to discouragement, despair, loneliness, all the, the symptoms that are common to every man. He, he had to deal with Jezebel. He had to deal with, you know, this witch coming after him to kill him. And it says, but this is powerful. It says he prayed and the heavens were shut. And he prayed again and the heavens were open. And this is what James is saying. In the same way Elijah's prayers could stop something and start something, so in the context of confession, you know, us Protestants, we always bust on, you know, Catholics for confessing to a priest. But guys, there's something powerful about confession to a brother. Mm. And being, but this is the power right here. He says in the same way Elijah stops something and starts something, when you confess something to a brother, he can stop cycles and start new cycles in your life. That's the power of a, a brother's prayer when you get honest. Yeah, wow. 
because you're bringing somebody else into that place of light and it just dispels darkness, hiddenness. I got it all figured out. And for a, for a lot of people who have, um, you know, those hidden things that are keeping them from uh, making the step to have the, I mean, they have brothers, they have friends, but what would you say to the one who just can't get himself to confess yeah. that thing, right? Yeah, you. I'll just tell you straight up. You need to get pissed off. You need to get angry that Jezebel's been chopping your off, and it's time to get your voice back. You aren't made to survive. As yeah. There's something in a man that's made to fight. And when you've given away your rights and you've lost your voice and your passion, man, we've got to fight. we got to fight for our voice, fight for our purpose. We're made for war. And wherever you've been silenced, whether by sin that's shut you down, emasculated you, maybe you've been shrinking back in your purpose and your call. I want to be like Mickey was to Rocky and say, <laughs> come on. And I want to cuss right now, but I'm not. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't be the you. first guest that curse. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we, we need, I think it's good for a man yeah. just to get slapped in the head and say, you're made for more than this. We, we, you got to fight for your family. Yeah. You got to fight for yeah, your daughters. Yeah, you got to fight for your sons. Yeah. We got to hold the line for the next yeah. generation. There were 800 prophets eating at Jezebel's table. Jeez. And there were a hundred that, that Obadiah hid. We need to get that prophetic spirit back on it. We got to fight. We'll get knocked down, That's but awesome. we get up. Yeah. Yeah. And Elisha dealt with loneliness, but you got to fight to come out of that. Yeah. So I, I remember we had a conversation, and you know, obviously for a lot of men, their their secret struggle is it's sexual in nature. Pornography is a big one for a lot of men. And you said something to me. You said um, you see a correlation between breakthrough and sexual addiction, and fasting, as a as a direct correlation to freedom mm. in that area. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I think that's something that the church doesn't talk much about. Yeah. Guys, I, there's a phrase that Paul says in Philippians 3. He says, the enemies of the cross, the, the God of their belly. He uses that phrase of the God of the belly, and which I think he's talking about appetites. And I believe physical appetites are connected to sexual appetites. And, and that when, if you're not putting your appetites into check and bringing them under the submission to the Lordship of Jesus and to the Spirit of God, they will run unchecked and you have no guards on them. Fasting starves those appetites out. Mm, that's it, good. It, it sanctifies those appetites. It, it cleanses the appetites and it purifies. And what it does is it puts the Holy Spirit, the spirit into the front seat and your soul, your mind, will and emotions get into the back seat. So what mm. fasting does is it brings order. Yes. And even, you know, it might be pornography or it might just be, even for married men, an, an, an inordinate obsession uh, with it that needs to be put into divine order mm -hmm. that I think uh, fasting has, has and, and will help. I think it's part of the makeup of God in helping us. Jeremy, did you hear the Lord's word for you? The... Fasting. I'm, yeah, man, I'm 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 constantly <laughs> fasting. Yeah, amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm I'm all for it. Yeah, I need a fresh doubt. call. I need somebody to slap me up. <laughs> come on, come on, um, man. I I I I heard Gordon Lindsay. I didn't hear him. He obviously died long before I was born. But he said, um, fasting creates providence. Um, and what we're living in today is. Um, has been born out of the things we fasted for yesterday, you know, fa and fasting that I have found, you know, has an, has a way of peeling things off of us and, and, and not only with sexual things, um, whatever it is that we're dealing with. I mean, I have had times where I feel like, man, I'm really needing just to meet with the Lord in a new way. And fasting has a way of drawing yeah. me in and, yeah. and almost like it's the, it's the great recalibrator. It's, it's like, like, look, I'm, I'm like resetting my life, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, what was the thing? Um, fasting is, uh, when you say, um, fasting says no to earthly things and yes, yes to, to heavenly, heavenly things. things, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. But, uh, yeah. So I'm all about it. All right. Your turn. 
we're fasting the rest of the week, guys. The whole the rest Whoa. of the podcast, no food. <laughs> uh, we're gonna put this I'm practice fast until the end of this podcast. Guys. <laughs> Come on, <Right>. somebody. <laughs> Jermaine, hey, just called me to it. Cool. Water only. Water Jermaine, only. you had something you wanted to say? No, I just want to say, I mean, it's so good. I, I know that I think some of these spiritual disciplines, you know what I mean? Like they, they, they've been seen as optional or kind of archaic, like fasting and prayer and, and you know, consecration, devotion, you know, being hidden away, stillness. Uh, I, I think that we have somehow been led to believe that these things are, are optional, you know, like if, if you, if you, if you want, you know, like if, Jesus said, when you fast, you know, when you pray, the assumption there, you know what I mean? Like, right. yeah, it, it wasn't like, but I think we've been led to believe it's optional and that we can somehow obtain whatever Christ wants to do in us apart from him, apart from the disciplines, from his methods. Yeah. yeah we see his methodology. We see Jesus doing it and it's just not popular. We, and, and I, it grieves it's me. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, it is hard, but I'm grieved by it because I think we're seeing a lot of unnecessary failures and defeats because of th these disciplines being forsaken. Mm -hmm. We've forsaken, you know, gathering together. We've forsaken prayer. We've forsaken. And so, you know, as I'm thinking about, as, you, as you're sharing, Corey, and others are sharing, I'm like, man, help us to return back to not only our first love, but to... His way of his life. His first practices. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, his methods and return to his disciplines because they're there not, they are hard, but they're there for our benefit and for our good. So, yeah. Um, shifting gears a little bit. One of the conversations we've been having behind the scenes, we actually did an Instagram poll about it. Was Jesus a nice man? Mm. And, um, <laughs> and I think a little bit over the majority said no. Some people are being really technical and be like, well, define nice for me. But I do think there is this unsaid value in the church culture that Christian men need to be nice. And the best definition I can come up with is Ned Flanders. You know who he is? The, the, the guy in The Simpsons, right? <laughs> really dorky Christian guy, right? We didn't get to watch The Simpsons. Oh, okay. We were well, you we're know, being I here. snuck it when my parents didn't know. But anyway... <laughs> Um, I think just the, the persona, it seems like in the church in general is, like you talked about men having fight and men getting their prophetic voice back and, and men being strong and men being courageous. I don't see a lot of that in the church. I don't see that value. I see a lot of like passive men. I see a lot of um, guys that go to church because their wives make them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, obviously there's exceptions. I understand that. But like, what is it about, maybe it's Western church culture. I don't know you travel a lot, that it seems like the definition of a good Christian man is just a nice, boring guy. Predictable. And then we look at Jesus and we say, he was kind, but he definitely wasn't nice. <laughs> so how do we reconcile this incorrect view of Jesus with the current Christian men we see typically? Like, what do you think about that? Does that make sense? Yeah. I. Yeah, Jesus is not nice. He is kind, but not. this is what nice means. Don't say anything offensive. Mm -hmm. You know, don't do anything offensive. Don't unsettle me. Don't, don't rock my boat. That's what nice is. And so it's kind of brought down into our men. Mm -hmm. It's just been across the board. We're, we're, we're dealing with this woke mob, this woke culture that has, you know, defined a strong man as a toxic man. And I think we're under assault in masculinity right now. And, and Jesus walked in profound humility, meekness, but he had no ounce of the fear of man in him. Mm. He had no ounce of political correctness in him. He didn't bow to sway, to political opinion, yeah. and to all the different things. Jesus is gangster with how he, the things he said, <laughs> Come on, when I like he it. said them. I like it. And, <laughs> and I think that's what... I think we're, we're, we're called to be conformed into his, his image. And I, and I think we, we need men that are fully men. We need strong men. We need men that yep. lead, men yep. that fight, men that do not let go and that turn their hearts to the next generation. When, when the kids don't want them or they come at them and we got fathers that go, no, I'm coming after you. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think, I think that's part of being conformed into the image, but us, shaking off this, you know, nice guy. 
uh, mm -hmm. thing. And if, I, I, we all want to be nice, kind, right. and all those kinds of things, but we just don't want to be neutered. Yeah. I tell you, walking I, around. I, I, <laughs> I um, come on. I, I was reminded of um, in Chronicles of Narnia when Susan is talking to. Um, Mr. Beaver, and they're talking about Aslan, and she said, "Aslan, he's a lion. He's a, a lion. Thought he was a man. Is, is is he safe?" And he says, "Of course he isn't safe, but he is good." You know, and and I love that idea. You know about um, the the nature of God, and He is perfect in all of His ways. He is unrivaled. He is unchallenged. Of course he's good. Of course he, you know, there are those who come to him and plead on his on his mercy. He has safety in his wings. But my goodness, he is to be feared, which was one of the things we talked about. Like he holds in his hands a sword. He's a man of war, and he's going to uh, subdue all things. He's controlling all things, ruling and reigning. Uh, I'm reformed in my theology. Um, so, but at the end of the day, at the end of it all. Um, you know, I think we, we approach God as we, we quoted before, you know, who may ascend to the hill of the Lord, who he has clean hands, but also a pure heart and trusting and knowing that, uh, listen, we have these safeguards kind of things that we hit on today. There are things around us, but also I want to keep my hands pure and also not just on the outside, but things on the inside, which, uh, which, you know, which, we, which I think, you know, David in the, the famous Bathsheba passage mm -hmm. in the springtime when kings go out to war. David remained home. Man, yeah. So it's actually the fight that's going to actually aid in keeping you pure. Man, that's good. I'm totally going to preach that very soon. Wow. <laughs> you better give him credit. You better give him credit for that. Uh, man of God told me. <laughs> <laughs> the bishop, man, the bishop. Would you say? All right. So, so then, give us a few things, like, and uh, as we kind of wrap up a little bit, give us a few things that men need to be fighting for. Like, what fights should we be in as, as good, strong, courageous Christian men? Yeah, you need to fight for your heart. Uh, I guess fight for your eyes. Fight for your, fight, for your, fight for your ears. Fight for your heart. Fight for vision. I, I think we've got to start thinking generationally. Yes. All right? Mm -hmm. I think some of us might hit that midlife state. And it does, you're not as awesome as you thought you're going to be, not as rich or as holy. And I think you've got to begin to think there are generations in the balance. Yeah. And so when I begin, I think fighting for vision that my little run here in my life has generational impact Dude, at stake. Yeah. I think we got to fight for that. You know, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Bro. And, and, I, and, and, and I think when you begin to connect that it matters that you not quit or give in or coast. I know seasons where I've just wanted to coast yeah. on last season's breakthrough. And the Lord says, no, no, buddy, yeah. there, there is more. In this life, you're made to fight. It's, it's Philippians 3. You know, forgetting the things that are behind and reaching. Yeah. I think we got to fight for our eyes, yeah, fight on. for our heart. we got to fight for vision, for generational vision. we got to fight for our marriages if we're married. We got to fight for the for the fresh eye contact with our wives and fresh eye contact with our children, and um, and and I, I think those are the things that we 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 contend for, um, and I think the Lord will reward the areas where we don't reach or match. I think it's the the constant declaring war, and I, and I think we can do this with perversion or immorality, pornography. We need to make it your make it your enemy. Yeah. Never come to peace with this thing, mm -hmm. and never come to rest saying this is the way it's always going to be. Mm -hmm. I believe in the power of God. I believe in the grace of God, and those are the things that matter. That the devil will tell you don't matter. Yeah. So just to recap: your eyes, your ears, your heart, your vision, your marriage, your kids. I mean, if you can do those things well, obviously you'll be going very far being a good man, a, a righteous man, a godly man. I like what and, John Piper says about that, and I, I know we're about to close, but he said, you know, one of the first things he prays for is is himself. He's like, I have, you know, one me. 
I, I, I work on myself, and then after that, I'm going after everything else. Yeah. And there, mm-hmm. You know, and there's a lot of tentacles to that. We have it's a lot like of like the circles of influence, <clears throat> right? Yeah. Right. There's spheres yeah. of authority. Mm-hmm. Certainly, yeah. pray over yourself, and don't yeah. forget you're 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 in a life that God's called you to do with other people around. Yeah, that's so good. Put your mask on first, right? If this is an airplane. Yeah. Put, put your mask on first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In case there is a drop in the cabin pressure and yeah. oxygen, please put your mask on first yeah, before helping man. someone else. Yeah. You know, creating me a clean heart, oh God, renew a right mm-hmm. spirit within me. I think it's, it's, it's that, you know, James looking in the mirror of the word of God and constantly, I like what Corey said earlier, wash, I, I, I said this, I want to live desperate. I refuse to be a professional Christian or pastor. I refuse yeah. to be an expert. I just want to live desperate. I just want to live close. I want to stay, you know what I mean? And I, I just, in my own heart, I just would encourage everyone listening, just stir Paul Timothy, fan in the flame. Yeah. Like, I don't make excuses yeah. Yeah. for, for uh, maturing. No, I'm not. That, that, I don't, I want to stay childlike. I want to stay tender. And I, and I really appreciate you sharing that, Corey. And I agree. We say yes and amen to that. Just staying desperate and staying, um, responsive to let our life be a response to the goodness of God. So, yeah. So good. Any closing thoughts, Corey, anything else you want to add? I don't have anything guys. I just, I think what you're doing is so needed in this hour. And so I'm just grateful for what you guys are doing. Well, thank thank you, you. man, for joining us, for speaking into our lives, for encouraging men. You've made an impact on probably way more people than you know, and we're a part of that group. So thank you for that. Um, before we go, anything you want to plug, like anything you're really passionate about that you're doing right now that you want people to connect to or anything you want people to know about you? Yeah, I, I mean, there's several things I'm doing. I travel, I do different things. I think the most thing I'm most passionate about in this hour is, uh, I've got an online, uh, school called Corey Russell online and we've got over 200 hours. We got about 40 something courses on building your life of prayer. Nice. And right now I'm really excited about this. We're doing a road to Emmaus series. So I'm literally going to over the next three years, walk through the Bible every month, walking through a book of the Bible. And I feel like that's what we got to get back to. We're in so many cultural conversations. I don't see anybody in the Bible anymore. And so that's one of my passions is to get a generation in the Bible and there, I do about three one-hour lives a month, and uh, it's a pretty vibrant online community. Is that on check Instagram? that out, CoreyRussellOnline.com. Oh, okay. So CoreyRussellOnline.com, you can connect to that, and it's a paid subscription, right? You can sign up and you get access. You get access to all your previous courses too, right? Everything. Anything you've released, yeah, everything. 25, 25 bucks a month gets you over 200 hours of content. Wow, awesome. And there's three, there's three hours of fresh content every month. Yeah, if you like this, I mean, this is just a teaser. Two hundred hours of Corey just dropping bombs all just day. Just screaming at you. So, <laughs> well, man, we appreciate you yeah. so much. Thank for your deposit in us and the men that listen to this episode. And for you guys out there, thanks for hanging out with us for a little bit. Remember, share this with the man who needs a little bit of encouragement today to get back in the fight. We appreciate you guys, and we will see you soon. Peace out.